Welcome to Rockbrook Church Podcast. Today's message is part of a series called Building Your Life on Values That Last. We know that God designed values for us to live by and to give us meaning and purpose in this life. We would love to hear from you and how God is using this message to give you a new perspective and hope. Email your story to church at rockbrook.org. Good morning, everybody. Uh, We're continuing on in our series on values today, looking at the value of honesty. Honesty, you know, the Bible has a lot of significant instruction on honesty. Examples of men and women who were honest, examples of men and women who were not honest, and the things that happened to them. The most radical being uh, the couple in the New Testament who were not honest and were struck down and died on the spot. And how many of you are so glad that God doesn't seem to be using that same technique uh, today? Uh, This place would be completely empty. I'd be here all alone with no one to talk to. (laughs) The irony of honesty is that all of us uh, make a big deal about it. We really want it. Uh, But in practicality, we give it little value. Uh, But when parents are asked to describe the number one quality they want in their children, what is it? Honesty. We even teach our kids. How many times have you heard a parent say to their kids, I know you're going to mess up. Like, I already know that. So when you do, don't make it worse by lying. Just tell the truth. Tell me the truth about it. And one of the things that I have just been realizing again in preparing for this week is how many opportunities... There are in any given day to be dishonest. Every conversation, every phone call, every interaction, we have dozens and dozens of opportunities to be dishonest, so much so that we expect a level of dishonesty in our lives, in our advertising, in our politics, in our conversations. I mean, there's just lines even that we hear all the time that Uh, They're lies, and they've just become a joke to us. The the check is in the mail. The doctor will call you right back. It was good to see you. (laughs) One size fits all. This hurts me more than it hurts you. Your table will be ready in just a minute. Pastor Ryland, your jokes are funny. It's just (laughs) lies and lies and lies. Read this week uh, in an article that research published in the Journal of Basic and Applied Psychology indicates that when Americans are talking to each other, 60% tell at least one lie in a 10-minute conversation. It may not seem like a big deal, extra detail here for effect, a simple excuse that doesn't harm anybody, a way to avoid the truth or hurting somebody's feelings. There are all ways that people lie to each other, often thinking that it's for the greater good. But those lies could lead to physical symptoms. A study from researchers at Notre Dame University found that when participants were instructed to be completely honest, not even telling white lies, they showed physical improvements, improvements in physical health. And so the Bible teaches that. Psalm 34, would you like to enjoy life? Do you want a long life? Do you want happiness? Then keep from speaking evil and from telling lies. That enjoying life and honesty are just linked together. And I think we could all give a testimony on this that when you tell a lie, you have to commit to the lie. And so when you conceal something, it affects you physically because there's so much stress with it. Every time the phone rings, Every time someone wants to sit down and have a serious conversation, you're thinking in the back of your mind, is this when I get found out? Is this when it all comes out? Is this when I get caught? Dr. Leonard Keeler, inventor of the lie detector machine, after testing 25,000 individuals, came to the conclusion that human beings are basically deceptive. Well, no joke. Thanks for catching up with what the Bible has been saying for thousands of years, Dr. Leonard Keeler. Welcome to the party, because we know at the core of humanity, there is dishonesty. 
those of us who read the Bible, this is no surprise. We know that in the book of Genesis, we're told that dishonesty has plunged this world into the mess that it's in. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful because we're part of a fallen race. We have wickedness that lives within us. Because of the fall, we have a resistance to the truth. So lying is not only in our culture, not only in our society, it's in our nature, and even more than that, dishonesty is part of a spiritual structure. It's much bigger than ourselves. There is a struggle going on in the cosmos, going on in the spiritual world, call it what you will, light versus darkness, God versus Satan, good versus evil, a struggle that uh, an eternal combat that's bigger than most of us are capable of understanding, where you and I are the object of the spiritual battle, and basically it comes down to this, truth versus falsehood. The Bible tells us that God is the father of truth. God is the father of truth. Satan is the father of lies. John 8, 44, Jesus said this, he, Satan, has always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. And so the Bible doesn't candy coat it. Christ doesn't candy coat it. Basically, it's saying God is on one side, Satan is on the other, and they are opposed to each other, and you and I have a choice. Do we follow culture or the creator? Do we follow God or do we follow Satan? And how we choose to use our words and how truthful we are, we're picking a character each time that we are being conformed to, that we are following. And when it comes to the creator, God's view of dishonesty, Scripture says he hates it. And that word that, that's used there isn't even used that often in Scripture. The word hate, it means it's dis- disgusting, detestable, utterly and thoroughly repulsive. Dishonesty is repulsive to God. Why? Why does, why does he hate it? Because he is the truth. And it's a perversion of his character. And because we're made in the image of God, and when we lie, we're perverting who we were created to be. And so God places a high premium on truthfulness. And he invites you and I to have a love affair with honesty. And so how can we be honest in a dishonest world? How can we follow the character of God when we're tempted to do otherwise. How do I tell the truth? Well, if you're taking notes, it starts with this. I've got to make a commitment to tell the truth consistently. Consistently. You know, someone may tell you the truth 80% of the time, but if they're not truthful all the time, how do you know if what they're saying is the 20% that's false? That's why God invites us to have a lifestyle of honesty. Yeah, nobody has a good enough memory to not do this. No one has a good enough memory to be a liar. Because when you tell a lie, you've got to remember the lie that you told, and then you've, it affects another area of your life, and you've got to remember all these things. If you just tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything, because it's just the way that it happened. Proverbs 11.3 says, People who can't be trusted are destroyed by their own dishonesty, that lying sabotages our own success. It damages our character. It damages our relationships. Every relationship is built on one word, trust, trust. And truth-telling builds trust. Even if, it, even if it's not an attractive truth, maybe even if it's not really what you want to share with that person, truth produces trust. And if you're a dishonest person, pretty soon you have no relationships because nobody can trust you. Proverbs 12, 19 says, Truthful lips endure forever, but lying tongue, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. So I tell the truth consistently. Second thing, if you're taking notes, I'm going to tell the truth completely. The whole truth, nothing but the truth. God says lying is an intention to mislead. And when you tell a half-truth, you're telling a whole lie. You can lie by falsifying, or you can lie by concealing. And when we deliberately hold back part of the truth, we're being deceptive. So you can, can you lie without even saying a word? Absolutely. If you, if, if you don't face issues honestly, if you conceal something, if you hold it back, 
you're not telling the truth completely. Proverbs 28, 23. In the end, people appreciate frankness more than flattery. And this, this is our memory verse for this week. And you might say, well, that, well, that's kind of a weird verse to commit to memory. But I'm going to spend the whole week memorizing this. Yes, because we all know this. Like, cons- it, we understand the concept. But when it comes down to actually sharing the truth, it can be confrontational at times. And so we second guess ourselves. We don't want to commit to it. It's unpleasant. So, for instance, maybe you have an employee that's not fulfilling their job. Maybe they're constantly goofing off on the job or something else. So you've got to correct them. When it comes down to that confrontation, you don't, nobody wants to do that. That's not fun. And they may not appreciate it then. But if it helps them build their character, they're gonna, it's going to help them in the long run. They're going to be grateful in the long run. And in theory, we all agree that honesty is the best policy. But when it comes down to actually being honest and having the confrontation, we think, ah, maybe this isn't such a good idea after all. But God says, in the end, people appreciate frankness more than flattery. So we tell the truth completely. Proverbs 10.10 says, someone who holds back the truth, they're just causing trouble. He's talking about concealing. What kind of trouble do you cause when you hold back part of the truth? Well, you cause mistrust, superficiality, resentment. You get into trouble by not saying what you mean, not meaning what you say. And marriages often get in trouble in this area because during the engagement period, they lie to each other. Maybe not overtly, but they lie by not facing the issues that they need to face. There may be major differences. There may be major wounds. There may be a major conflict that's consistently swept under the rug or pushed aside because, hey, we want to enjoy our engagement. We want to plan a wedding. We want to be in love with one another. And then afterwards, the truth comes out. Why, why would we ever hold back the truth? I think that's a big question we've got to wrestle with this weekend is, why, would, why do we lie? Why would we ever lie? Why would we hold back the truth? And once you understand the motivation behind the lies we tell, you can deal with the real issue. Because lying is not the real problem. That's an outward action. It's a symptom of a deeper problem. Jesus said it this way. He said, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So lying is the outward action, but it's just an outward action of what's happening on the inside. The way you think, what you believe, what's in your heart, what you're motivated by. So if I'm going to become a person of integrity, if I'm going to become an honest person, I don't start with my lips, the outward action. I've got to deal with the way I think, what I believe, what's motivating me. So I have found it helpful to just categorize lies Uh, by some different motives and different kinds. So uh, here's some lies we tell. In just a minute, I'll give you the the motive. But the cruel lie. It's a type of lie that we tell. And it's someone has hurt you, and you want to get even with them. So you misrepresent them. This is called slander. And slander means that you make up something about somebody that's not true with the intentional purpose of damaging their reputation. And we see this all the time in our culture. The Sadducees did this to Jesus. They brought false charges so they could uh, get them on the cross. And the cruel lie is an intentional, mischievous lie. What's the motivation behind this lie? Lots of motivations. Jealousy, anger, rage, hate, revenge. I think we could sum it all up with this word if you're taking notes. That is resentment. Cruel lies are driven by resentment. Number two, the cowardly lie. This is the kind of lie that you tell to escape consequences. So you want to avoid the punishment. You want to prevent the pain. This is the the motive of the my dog ate my homework lie. That's the classic lie. This is the lie that Adam told in the Garden of Eden when he sinned. He didn't take it like a man. He blamed his wife. When you don't want to get in trouble, you tell a cowardly lie. What's the motive behind that kind of lie? The motive is fear. And God says the fear of man is a snare, is a trap. When a person 
when one person has an overwhelming personality and you just go along with them, you just go along with it, we end up telling uh, fearful, cowardly lies out of fear when you don't stand up for what God says is acceptable or unacceptable because of fear. It's peer pressure. It's peer pressure. When you don't have the courage to say no, it's a cowardly lie. Next lie, next type of lie is the conceited lie. And this is where we tell lies to impress, to cover for a mistake. The motive is insecurity. Insecurity. And it comes out as pride sometimes, but when you strip away pride, you generally find insecurity. And we don't, we do this when we don't want to share what the real grade we got is and get help. We'd rather have people think we're smarter than we really are. It's pride or insecurity. You know, the fish gets bigger every time. And you begin to tell these stories because it's just, I'm not good enough just the way I am. The way the story actually is, people may not like it. And it's the kind of lie we use when we try to hide our hurt. And if someone, has, if someone has wounded us deeply, we say things like, well, that, that doesn't bother me. They don't bother me. When really they do. And if someone's making a threat and we say, well, just go ahead and leave and see how I feel. We're t- telling a cowardly lie saying that it, what you do isn't going to affect me when it really will. The lie is based on insecurity. Another type of lie is the calculated lie. And this is a lie that we strategically use to manipulate other people or situations when we want our way. We want what we want. We're going to get what we want to get. And it's motivated by greed. By greed. And when you love what you want, when you love money, you will use a calculated lie to get more of it. And the last type of lie we'll talk about today is the convenient lie. The convenient lie uh, we tell because it just takes effort to tell the truth, doesn't it? It's just, it's hard work. It takes effort. It takes time. It takes clarity. It takes energy. So to not have to explain yourself and just shrug off the truth, like, you don't want to get involved in something, so you tell the officer, well, I didn't, I didn't see anything, when you really did. Or you're too busy to, t- to check the facts, so you tell something that you haven't really checked up on, that you really don't know about, and it just becomes false gossip. And so much of gossip is just a convenient lie. I didn't care to really look into it. I didn't care to check into the truth. So I'm just going to share what I think or share... What I, what I want to say about this, and the convenient lie we do just because we don't want to take the time, the hard work, the energy. What's the motive? The, what's in the heart is laziness. And we, we use other words for it, like diplomacy, which is, well, I don't, want to, I don't want to offend anyone. But if we tell the truth consistently and completely, and we find out the motives for our lives and we start telling the truth, how, how, do we, how do we do that? And so this is where we've got to kind of turn the page and say, well, how, how am I going to do this? And one thing we've got to remember is when we tell the truth, we've got to do it lovingly. So don't use the truth as a club. Don't beat people over the head with truth. So just think of somebody in your mind. Bring to mind somebody now who you would like to help change. You would like to help them make a change in their life. People change easier and people change faster when you speak the truth in a spirit of love. People always perceive truth without love as an attack on them personally. What you say might be 100% right, but if it's yelled, if it attacks the person rather than the problem, if it's beaten over them, if it's used as sarcastic jabs or or under-the-table jabs constantly, they resist it. They become defensive against it. They don't want to hear it because it's perceived as an attack. So we must speak the truth in love. Ephesians chapter 4 is a great uh, place to study this. You may want to read that chapter in your small group this week or in your personal study. The Apostle Paul is talking about 
uh, heresy and the different lies that there are out, out there about Christ and Christianity. He starts talking about uh, the gifts that God has given the, the church to build them up in truth. And he says, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. So how do I know if I'm speaking the truth in love? Ephesians 4.29 tells us. Don't use foul or abrasive language. Let everything you say be good and say this word with me, helpful, so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. How do I know if I speak the truth in love? You ask yourself this question. Who am I trying to benefit from this? So, Am I trying to change them so it'll be easier on me? Or am I sharing this with a friend or loved one because I really care about them and want them to be the best that they can be? If I'm doing it for their benefit, then it's coming from a loving attitude. I'm speaking the truth in love. If I'm doing it just to help me out, to help my reputation or to make life easier on me, it's a selfish motive. So we speak the truth in love. Number four, we tell the truth tactfully. Being honest does not mean being brutal. It, it does mean being clear. So uh, it doesn't mean you have to introduce a bunch of mystery and veil the truth and, and, and have so much tact that, well, now what, what are we saying? It does mean you be clear, but you don't have to be brutal to be clear. And whenever you need to share a tough truth, the solution is never deception. It's tact, not deception. Proverbs 12, 18 says, Thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, but wisely spoken words can heal. And if you think about it, emotional wounds last longer than physical wounds. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me is not true. It does hurt. And when you speak the truth in love and with tact, you can learn how, you can learn how to make a point without making an enemy. Have you learned that skill? Have you learned how to make a point without making an, turning that coworker into an enemy? Without turning your spouse or your child into an enemy? This is very important in saving your marriage, in saving your relationship with your children, the people you work with, the loved ones in your life. It's to be able to make your point without attacking the person and turning them into an enemy. So if I have a tr- tough truth to share with someone, maybe I'm confessing something, Maybe it's a truth that uh, they really need to hear to help them in their character and change their life. What are some ways I can do that? Uh, Write this down. I need to plan my presentation. The more pleasant his words, the more persuasive he is. I would suggest that you plan your presentation. Now, planning your presentation doesn't mean that you sit down and think about all the comebacks you're going to say to all the resistance that they're going to have. No, planning your presentation means, hey, I'm just going to put pen to paper here and write down what the issue is and maybe write down a couple of points about how that's affecting things so that when I have this conversation and things get off track, I can bring it back. I have this in front of me. Here's what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to solve every problem in our relationship today. I'm just bringing this truth, this thing. And you plan it out. You, you think it through. One other thing I've got to do is choose the right time. So put your mind in gear before you put your mouth in gear. Timing is everything. Proverbs 16.23 says, Intelligent people think when? Before they speak. Like before you say it. The other night, Thursday night, 10 o'clock at night, I get home. And I chose that as the time to bring up a very tough subject with my wife. We're both exhausted from the work week. We're both frustrated. It did not go well. And afterwards, I I thought of all these ways I could have done it better. I didn't think before. But how many times do we speak and we think, well, I haven't really thought this through yet. Yeah, think it through before. And if you say, I really want to be a person of integrity, You've got to think it through before. You've got to come to God and say, well, God, I'm going to start with me. And I admit, I admit it, I'm a liar. And God, I don't always tell the truth. And sometimes I tell half-truths. 
and you ask Christ to forgive you and give you the power to change and say, God, I, I'm powerless against this. I need you to put a new heart in me and he will begin to replace deception with the truth as you begin to let Christ more and more in your heart. And you do that by making a choice. Not in your notes, but as we leave here today, we all have a choice of are we going to care about our reputation or our character? Because reputation is what other people think of you. Character is what God thinks about you. Reputation is what you want everybody to believe. Character is reality. Reputation is what impresses people. Character impresses God. Reputation is what your spouse or your parents think about you. Character is what you do when your spouse or your parents are out of town. Reputation is what people believe about you. Character is who you really are. Character is what you do in the dark when no one's watching, when your reputation is unaffected by it. And when you say to God, God, I'm more interested in my character than my reputation, then you'll tell the truth, even if it's not good for your reputation. Because you know in the long run, it's building your character, which is the only thing you're taking into heaven with you. You don't take your reputation into heaven. God says everything will be revealed. So do you care about your reputation or your character? And if you do, I would suggest that you confess it to God, you come to God, and then you get some support. Like come clean in your small group this week. That's a safe place to do that. Celebrate Recovery is an amazing place to get a fresh start with honesty. I don't know how many people I've heard from that went to Celebrate Recovery to work on, a, on an addiction, and they said it had this whole other benefit where I came out an honest person. And that's a great place uh, to take a calculated risk and begin speaking the truth and confessing the truth. Why, why do this? Why should we do this? I, should, I want to end kind of on an up note today of what's the motive behind all of this? Why does God want us to speak honestly and what does he promise to do for us? Three things, very quickly. God blesses honesty by guarding us. He is a shield, and that word shield is like a bodyguard to those who walk with integrity. He's like a bodyguard to our spirit, to our character. He also promises to bless us by directing us. By directing us. The godly are directed by honesty. The wicked fall beneath their load of sin. And oftentimes uh, when people say, I just can't get God's clarity for my life. I don't know God's will for my life, my purpose, any of those things. It's because they're being dishonest in an area of their life. When we're honest, we see God's way. The direction becomes very clear. That's a reward. The third thing he promises to do is sustain us. Truthful words stand the test of time, but lies are exposed. Honesty will outlast dishonesty. When I was in t a teenager, I was in youth group, and I remember hearing a story that some of you may remember. It, it made national news. It was about a story or about a couple, a newlywed couple in Chicago, who uh, they got married, and then they opened their presents before they left for their honeymoon. So they opened all the cards, all the presents, pulled out all the cash from their big wedding, put it in a suitcase that to use on their honeymoon. They put the suitcase on the trunk of their car and drove off. $12,000 lying in a suitcase in the middle of the street, and an unemployed guy finds it. And he, what does he do? He was an honest man, and he went to all the work to find the couple and return the money. The city of Chicago went hysterical about this guy. How can an unemployed guy do something like that? Why didn't he just take the money? He had to search to find out whose it was. When the story broke, this guy got job offers from Sony, Hilton, Hyundai, Motorola, and more. He was rewarded for his honesty. And in kind of a physical way, that is an example of what God does in a spiritual way. God is in the business of rewarding honesty. He delights in the truth. And you know what? I've seen people rewarded for their honesty in this life. Absolutely. I'll tell you, I've also seen people lose their jobs because of honesty. They finally confess something. 
Maybe they wouldn't be dishonest when the company was pressuring them to be unethical. But they have to wait for the next life for their reward. You have to care, you've got to decide what you care about, your character or your reputation. You and I have to determine who do we trust and who are we putting our hope in. Let's pray together. Well, if you're here today, and this is all just a foreign language to you, it's because you don't have a relationship with God, and I invite you to ask him into your life today. All of us mess up, fall short. The Bible calls it sin. We're all sinners. That, yes, we might compare well to some, but compared to the holiness of God, we fall short and need salvation that's what Jesus said. He says, if you want to get to God, you've got to come through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And maybe you're in that situation and you just need to say something in the silence of your heart now. It says, God, thanks for loving me. I haven't always been truthful. Forgive me. Come live in my life. Help me to be the person you want me to be. Help me to be a person of truth. Lord, that's the prayer of all of us today. We are created in your image, and at the end of the day, we long for truth. And God, I pray that we would not just embrace it as a concept, but we would live it out practically. God, we thank you that you're a God of grace and forgiveness, that when we fall short, you pick us up, that your love for us isn't based on our past, or what we've done. It's the, based on what Christ has done. It's based on the fact that we are your children. And for that, we are thankful. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook Church. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.